uh, oppression for all communities. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's bring in international relations expert uh, David Kikaya joining us from our city centre studios. Good afternoon, David. Uh, many Zimbabweans have turned uh, Mugabe's resignation as Zimbabwe's second Independence Day. But is this post-Mugabe era really the beginning of the unfolding of full democracy in the country? I think you could say so uh, in more ways the, than one, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that... Uh, since Mugabe took over uh, 37 years ago, uh, Zimbabwe has been ruled by only one party, ZANU PF. Mm -hmm. So one would think that uh, when the new dispensation takes over, one hopes that uh, they can bring in some semblance of democracy. Uh, to me, this is going to be imperative. Imperative in the sense that uh, uh, Emerson Munangangwa, who is taking over more or less, has to contend with quite a number of interest parties, some of them which precede him. Uh, for example, if you look at a, a person uh, like Morgan Shangrai, mm -hmm. was at the front, uh, front runner in the liberation struggle when he formed his uh, movement for democratic uh, change. So people like that would need to be brought in. You have uh, uh, very vociferous uh, ladies like Yossi Mujuru, who, who strange enough, during the veteran years, was also called spill blood, you know, a woman spill blood. He is also garnering for a position in there. The Bengwa is an interesting other person because when Joshua Nkomo merged uh, his uh, Zapu PF with uh, Mugabe's uh, uh, Zanu for the sake of taking power from uh, the UDI, uh, Ian Smith, uh, at one point he fell out of favor with Mugabe. And where, therefore he went with a very strong constituency that used to back. Uh, veteran uh, Joshua Nkomo. So yes, uh, the Bengwa would also be wanting to have a, a foot, especially in the transition government. What perhaps Munanganga may want to uh, look for is a guy called uh, Tendai Biti. Tendai Biti, uh, some of you will recall, in the first unit, amongst the first unity governments, uh, from the year 2009 to about 2013, he, he steered uh, the Minister of Finance and he received quite a number of accolades from the international uh, community uh, as a man who, uh, although he was a, he's a professional, professionally he's a lawyer, but uh, when he took over the portfolio of finance, he did quite a good job. So these are the kind of uh, forces that uh, Mnangangwa will have to deal with upfront. Uh, he's lucky because the leader of the army, uh, you know, Constantine Chiwenga, is an old buddy of his. So from that point of view, he could very easily make an understanding with, with the army. And we've seen how disciplined they were. And I hope uh, other African countries can borrow a leaf list of all uh, ours here in Kenya. In terms of uh, civil disobedience that is in line with the wishes of the people and not going uh, to confront them. So yes, we, we are seeing uh, Zimbabwe on a second liberation, if you like. Right. A second liberation but which will have to contend with the democratic, democratic principles. All right, uh, let's discuss this man, Munagangwa, uh, uh, just for a moment, because uh, he yes. is a man who has been uh, Mugabe's right-hand man for the uh, most of the 37 years right. uh, that uh, Robert Mugabe was in power. There are those right. who say that he is unlikely uh, to lead to liberalization because he has also been accused of, uh, he is a man also deeply implicated in corruption and human rights abuses in Mugabe's regime. He is accused of leading um, several crackdowns that led to the death of an estimated 20,000 uh, civilians in uh, Zimbabwe. Yeah. He is also yeah. allegedly accused of having orchestrated campaigns uh, that led to violence in Zimbabwe between 2000 and 2008. So with these implications of human rights abuses in Mugabe's regime, how likely is he right. to l really yeah. lead to liberalization in Zimbabwe? In fact, he's beginning up on a very slippery uh, road as far as human rights are concerned. You know, uh, that, that led to him being called the crocodile, and that's not a very flattering uh, name for anyone to be called. So yes, he's coming in from, or, from and on a pedestal of uh, not having a very good record of human rights. But you know, it, it, blame games are very interesting things. He, he's most likely to argue that I was on a second in command and as uh, command chain demands, I was only executing the commands of uh, my, my, my boss. 
insofar as he can convince the world that that was the case, and insofar as the world is willing, including the Zimbabweans themselves, to forgive him for that, then yes, he has uh, the goodwill. Right now, he ought to bear in mind, he enjoys a lot of goodwill, a lot of goodwill, first and foremost, within Zimbabwe and among Zimbabweans across the board. So far, I have not seen anyone who has pointed a finger. Zimbabwe has two main ethnic groups, the Ndebeles, who were headed by Joshua Nkomo previously, and uh, uh, the, uh, the Shonas, who were uh, Mugabe's stronghold. But for some interesting reason, which I hope he can build on, the two have come together, uh, and people like the Bengwa coming on board and saying, let us build uh, our country. But also another dimension, which I think he would have to look at, is the diaspora. I think in Africa, Zimbabwe has one of the highest diaspora, close to people estimate between three to four million outside there. How does he loop this in? Even if they don't come back to fill positions in the government, how does he capitalize on them and convince them that he has set uh, economic conducive investment opportunities for them so that they can, although working outside, repatriate some of their funds. And we here in Kenya have seen how, uh, in fact, the diaspora can be very beneficial. He, if he taps in all this and builds, builds a democratic uh, platform that uh, people can have confidence in, he is still attracted. One of the main important things they ought to do and should not fall victim of is to put a time bound on how long the transition government is going to be in power. I don't want to give them more than one year myself. I think within one year, they should be able to put in place, and especially since they now enjoy this overwhelming international uh, support. You've seen uh, British Prime Minister May talking not uh, very unflattering ab about him. If they can build on this, they can very easily, quickly move to putting a machinery in place that can lead to elections. The last point on that particular point I want to mention here is that Zimbabwe has very good structures. If there's a country that the, the British left in good stead with the workable structures, there were only two countries in Africa. Zimbabwe was one of them, and our beloved Kenya was also one of them. These were the two countries that the British were not going to leave at whatever cost. They were the last bastion. So they put structures in place, and even infrastructure, in place such that it could work. What we lacked are the people with the political will, forget about economics, the political will to graft upon those structures, policies, and the instruments that would then would catapult us. If Zimbabwe can go back to that blueprint and put in place uh, structures and policies, especially for economic development, that country is going to take off even within the first five years, and it will be amazing. All I have right. had the privilege to visit it during the UDI time and also after, and I can say that with confidence. All right, uh, let's finally discuss uh, Zimbabwe's involvement of uh, uh, the military in uh, politics because uh, it seems uh, in Zimbabwe that, that the military seems very loyal to the ruling party ZANU PF. I remember back in 2001 when it seemed rather. Um, impossible for Mugabe to be re-elected. The army had then held a televised news conference uh, reiterating their support for uh, the ruling party ZANU-PF and saying that they would intercede at the time, or intervene rather, if Mugabe did not, was not re-elected or did not win that election. And so there have been questions as to where uh, Zimbabwe's military would lie with its uh, loyalty to the ZANU-PF and whether this then would pave way for a free and fair election in future. I think Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwe's uh, military forces have sh taught us in Africa a very great lesson, if we have been listening and if we have been watching. Yes, you know, they are, they are the making of Mugabe, first and foremost. Almost all of them are Mugabe's students in one way or the other, including Mnangangwa himself, including even Chimwenga, who is the, the army commander and has been army commander since 1994. Uh, the fact that Munangangwa is enjoying the friendship, personal friendship, with the current uh, commander, Konstantin uh, uh, Chiwenga, in itself gives us hope that the army will retreat into the barracks, and they have said that, and therefore leave him the freedom to form a transition government and be able to carry on. The litmus test, test I think, for uh, Munangangwa, and he ought to be conscious about it, the army will be watching 
how inclusive is this government? Because let's face it, no army or even police force is willing to go and deal with internal strife uh, if, they, if they can avoid it. But if they see that even Mnangamwa is now leading them to down that path that they have just left, then chances are that you can be sure they will not be too far for call. All right. Many thanks for speaking to us. That is uh, David Kikaya, international relations expert. Just breaking down the political situation in Zimbabwe there uh, with uh, Zimbabwe's incoming president, Emerson Mnagangwa. He is set to be sworn in on Friday this week. It is an event we'll be keeping an eye on right here on.